Good morning, church. Please join with me in the prayer of confession. O Lord, our God, perfect in wisdom and holiness, your right hand is glorious in power. With it, you shatter the enemy and make known the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures evermore. Your steadfast love is our refuge. We fear no enemy, for you are with us. We will, not, we will not be dismayed, for you are God, and there is no other. You strengthen us and help us so that we might please you. You uphold your people with your righteous right hand, and our assurance rests in you alone. Lord, we confess our sins in sorrow, for you have given us your Holy Spirit that we may do so. His indwelling beauty informs and reshapes our conscience, and the righteousness of Christ is our fortress. We are preserved in him. We confess that our behaviors serve to reveal our imprudence. We know that one indiscretion or folly overshadows wisdom. Though we are prone to it, we yet hate the foolishness that offends you. May therefore our thoughts and our deeds prove wisdom is ours. For you have not redeemed a nation of fools, but of priests and ambassadors. We confess that we, have, that we often forget to trust in your providential care over all things and that our prayers are also for your use. We ask forgiveness as though it were not ours, yet our souls know that we have this for us. It has been done. When the edge is before us, you stay our feet. When we wander off as though we knew no better, you pursue us, for we belong to you. And so, though our words of thanks seem hardly sufficient, may our hearts thus prove. You have given us everything that we need, and all those things that our imaginations cannot know. Although we are distracted by the weight of daily burdens, we know you are aware and are moving within our steps. We don't, know, we don't know what is to be, but we know the promises that you have given. Thank you for watching over what we do not know, for we may certainly delight in your integrity. And though the darkness abounds, our trust is settled in you alone. We pray now, Lord God, Help us to honor you in every endeavor. Calm our confusion and slow our many words so that they will not consume us. Help us to be humble and by insights of wisdom, see circumstances and the things about us for what they are. May our spirits with your spirit observe our own thoughts as they come so that our tongues have barriers to cross. Make us wealthy in wisdom and rescue us from the poverty of foolishness. Help us to understand true prosperity, for many have much, but the poor are richer than any. Give us wisdom that we would pursue our pleasure in you. Bring our love, our intellect, and our deeds into perfect alignment with you. This and more we pray for the glory of Christ. Amen. Well, I'm filling in for announcements. It's good to be back. Uh, we've been gone a few weeks, a few Sundays, so it's good to be back. Uh, Mimi and the kids, they won't be here because they're, they're a little sore this morning um, from activities yesterday, but, uh, um, and I'm a little sore. We were working the house. Um, the house doesn't take care of itself, so this past week has been cleaning up and yard work and a lot of other things. Um, California was nice, but it's a good place to be from. Um, it's, it's good to be back home in Idaho. Um, the only regret is about a week ago, I was craving in and out 
and there is no in and out here. So if, if there's anything good about California other than family and friends and the beach, it's in and out. So, um, well, this morning I'm filling in doing announcements, and I know Pastor Matt and Pastor Gabe did a great job uh, filling the pulpit and bringing the Word of God uh, the past few weeks. And um, uh, they're off this week, so I am uh, doing announcements, and I just want to um, pass on that Randy, uh, Deacon Randy, says that the men's retreat information packets are in the back foyer. So if you're going to the men's retreat, uh, please uh, make sure you grab that on the way out this morning to Atlanta, and that's Atlanta, Idaho. Um, ironically, I'll be, I won't be attending men's retreat this, this, um, this year because the Monday, the following Monday, and you can be praying, I'm, I'm, I won't be preaching next Sunday. I will be here next Sunday, but I'll be going to Atlanta, the other Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, for a week. Um, Focus on the family. Many of you are familiar with Focus on the family. Um, They have a a training week that uh, they contacted me about that I'll be attending in Atlanta. So, and um, I'll be gone for that week. So it'll be kind of interesting. I've been, I can say I've been to both Atlantas. Um, Atlanta, Idaho, and Atlanta, Georgia. I don't know if there's any other Atlantas in the United States, but how many of you have been to Atlanta, Idaho? I'm just curious. Okay, quite a few. Quite a few of you have been there. Um, but I'll be praying that the men's retreat goes well next next week, next weekend, and that uh, God just blesses the men who gather. One one blessing from last year that I went is there's no cell phone coverage. So. You are totally disconnected from the world. You don't even know what's going on. And I'm a news junkie. I just check what's going on in the world. And it was just kind of good to disconnect and say, you know, what's going on in the world really doesn't matter right now. Um, what's going on in, in, in my life, what God's doing in my life, it really forces some introspection and, and to think about what God's doing and working in your life and to really engage in the fellowship with the other men who are going. Summer park play dates, uh, you can notice in your bulletin that's taking place, and um, VBS decoration day is coming up, and that's going to be next Sunday, so a week from today, after services. If you plan ahead next Sunday, if you, if you uh, want to help, come prepared to help after church next Sunday to do some decorating. Um, the VBS team, they, they do a tremendous job in really transforming the church into the world that they're creating for VBS, and they, they do a fine job every year in creating sort of a set and, and, and for, for VBS to take the kids into the world, to journey into the place that we're trying to bring here. So um, a lot of work goes into that, and they're putting out the call for help, so um, please note that. There is no bake sale today. Um, we have usually had bake sale on, on this Sunday of the month, but uh, there isn't one today. Just FYI. Another um, upcoming event is the church picnic, and that's always fun. That's at Lions Park. And just note that on your calendar so that when August 4th comes around, um, you're preparing to do that. But also note that there's a call for help for the church picnic, there's an opportunity to serve. So Notice that uh, there's a list here of things that need to be done to make this picnic possible. Food prep, setup, cooking, cleanup, etc. cetera. So if, uh, if you're able to serve in any of those areas, please let us know so that uh, the picnic can be uh, planned accordingly. There's also a couple other opportunities at the bottom. Those are just opportunities to serve in the community. Hands of Hope Northwest is a local nonprofit ministry that supplies a lot of medical supplies around the world to those who are in need. That's kind of their mission. And they put out the call that they could use some help. And also the Care House Food Pantry. This is uh, just down the street from us. Our neighbors, uh, Nampa First Church, First Nazarene, right next door. So across the street from them, some of you have, maybe some of you have noticed, some of you might not have noticed. There's a house that they have that's right across the street, just down the block, and they distribute food every week from that house. So it's their, it's their food pantry for this local community. And there's lots of families in this community that are served by the, that food distribution. 
but uh, they, they would be glad to have assistance and help from our church. It's not strictly just a first NAS thing as far as the volunteers are concerned. So if you're looking, again, for an opportunity to serve in the community, Neil Moore is the contact guy and his number's in the, the bulletin. You can just call and ask what kind of help they need and whether it's a good fit for you or not. I know it usually is during kind of normal working hours if, if you're working a typical eight to five, so the logistics might be challenging. But if you have some flexibility in your schedule and you're looking for an opportunity to help with food distribution, um, stocking the shelves and serving the public just down the street, there's that opportunity that's listed there. So um, I think that's all I'm going to cover. Are there any special announcements the congregation can make this morning? Any special announcements from the congregation? Did you have one? No. Okay. Well, if not, we're going to move to congregational prayer. Thank you. All right. The uh, still praying for China and their individual provinces. This province today is Shanxi, or Shan, yeah, Shanxi province. And Shanxi means uh, west of the mountains. So it's a, it's in the, I guess you'd call it the northeastern part of the country. And it has a population of over 36 million almost 36 million, 536.5 million, however you call it. The predominant re religions in Shanxi are, like most of China, are the Chinese folk religions, uh, Buddhism, Taoists, uh, all those kinds of uh, what some would call uh, occult uh, and cultish religions in China. Uh, at the latest count, what I could find on as far as Christians, there's there's uh, about not quite two and a half million, or excuse me, two and a half percent uh, of the 36 million in this particular province. One note in in this province, there was a church called the Golden Lampstand. It was what we'd call here in America a mega church, and it served as many as 50,000 Christians. It was, uh, I keep speaking in past tense, it was one of the country's largest Protestant evangelical churches until Chinese police uh, demolished it in 2018, January of 2018. They used heavy machinery and di dynamite. They used uh, all kinds of different excuses as to why that church uh, was, one, was unregistered, uh, acting illegally, uh, but uh, unfortunately, like what's happening all over China, uh, the Chinese government is cracking down and, and trying to eliminate all religions, not just the Christian religion. Uh, it was a pretty big building. Uh, it was, it was uh, built in 2009 with a, at a cost of just over $3 million. It was... Uh, the money came from donations from Christian, uh, from Chinese Christians, so it was a is a very big, big building. It's kind of huge, in fact. Some of the pictures were pretty magnificent. So we'll continue praying for the Chinese Christians in all of China. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of being able to be in your church. And we thank you for your many mercies and your many blessings. And we pray, Father, for the English teachers in Central Asia, for Brian and Belinda Isaac. We, we pray for them, their families, their children. Lord, as they seek to be salt and light in a country that predominantly doesn't know you. Lord, we pray for their safety and their effectiveness. We thank you for our city and county government. We thank you for all the people that serve in these, in these capacities. Be with them, Lord, as they seek to make the best decisions for the people of our cities and, and counties. Be with them, Lord, as, they, as they're away from their families. Uh, support them, Lord. Bless them in all they do. We thank you for our, our families here in our church, the Masevich family, the McKeith family, and, and the Morris family, Lord. 
be with them in their marriages, in their health, in their relationships, and as they seek to bring their children up in your light, Lord, and pray that their children will follow you all the days of their lives. Lord, we continue to pray for China. We pray, Lord, that, that you would be with all the Christians there, be with them as they, as they seek to serve you, worship you, praise you all over China. Lord, continue to build this nation with people that love you and want to serve you. Lord, we thank you for the, for the offering and we pray that you would use these, these offerings to build up your church. We thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen. It's one of my favorite songs. I've been listening to that a lot. I don't know who sings it. I should know. Elevate, Elevate Worship. Elevate Worship. Okay. Um, it's it's kind of catchy and it's very encouraging. So I've been, been singing that. So, um, Well, this morning... <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to turn to Ephesians instead of Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> I'm going to postpone the sermon I was going to preach this morning and link it with um, when I'm back with consecutive Sundays to kind of close out Ecclesiastes. So um, this morning I'm taking the opportunity to preach one of the passages that's one of my favorite passages in, in Scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And... As someone who's committed to preaching verse by verse through books, there's tons of passages that are powerful that you just love to preach. And it's like, well, I have to preach the whole book and just wait for the Sunday to get to that text. But once in a while, like this morning, um, those texts, I'll be like, you know, I'm just going to preach that text as a standalone because uh, the people of God need to hear and be encouraged by what God has to say to us in this text. So Ephesians chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 1 to 10 Hopefully I'll straighten my voice out here. Let me drink some water. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, that's better. Verses 1 to 10. And if you would, please stand as I read God's word this morning. <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord this morning. What God has to say to us in his eternal word. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, there's a lot to unpack in these 10 verses, and I try my best to really just take a snapshot of the themes that Paul covers in these 10 verses in Ephesians chapter 2. But the emphasis in these 10 verses is the new life that we have in Christ. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, and he wants to remind them, and God wants to remind us this morning, of what how our salvation transpired, why we needed to be saved, and what we're saved for. And also this idea of status. Our current status is different than the status that we had before. All of this is contrasted in these 10 verses. And the contrasting sort of outline is, is pretty 
easy to discern in these 10 verses, so it makes it easy to preach. Walk, notice the word walk, the action walk. Paul refers to walking the way we walked in verse 2, and he refers to walking again in verse 10. But of course, what we're walking in and how we're walking has changed radically from verse 2 to 10. We were dead and walking, he describes in the first few verses, but we are alive and walking in verse 10 as a result of God's work, his intervention. There's also the, the topic of good works, which the Apostle Paul is clear to, to point out in verses 8 through 10, uh, how they play a role in our salvation. And it's very important to note the distinction that he makes, that they do not earn our salvation, but we are saved for good works. So we're going to examine all of this, but let's start at verse, verses 1 through 3, which is really the first unit of thought in this text that I want us to see. And Paul here is describing our past bondage. If you are saved in Christ, in the Lord Christ Jesus, the Apostle Paul speaks to the church at Ephesus, and God speaks to us this morning and reminds us of who we were, past tense. Notice that in verse 1. He says, you were. And Paul here is referring to status and the way we acted. And there's going to be a challenge as we work through this text, because some of you, even though you are saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes you walk in the way that's described of the former life. And when that tension arises in Scripture, the Apostle Paul reminds us of our status. What is our primary status? And then calls us to be what we are. Calls us to be what we are. So Paul here, though, he is equating what our status was, who we were, and how we walked, and equates those. And then talks about the radical transformation we have in God's grace, and describes that we are now his workmanship, and we're, we're created for good works. That ought to be the norm, but it's often the not. So just right out of the gate, I'm kind of making this sort of qualification that it is sad that there are some Christians who I believe are truly saved, who are trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, who are saved by grace, who struggle in their walk. And it ought not be, according to Paul, the way he, he describes it as the, the, the kind of the fallen lifestyle is, is associated with the past this past bondage, but we're released from that. So part of salvation includes this qualitative change in our nature, who we are. So not just our status, how God sees us, but who we are. And so Paul wants to point out in this passage this radical change in our nature. We are different people. We have different instincts. But yes, it is sad to note that oftentimes as Followers in Jesus, we're not immune to this. The disciples themselves, times stumbled and fell. They're fallible. And God's grace is greater than our sin and preserves us even when we walk according to our former self. But <clears throat> I know some in the church where that change in being saved is quite radical. That there was former bondages and, and sin patterns in your life that God has broke and delivered you from. And I know others in the church that I believe, again, are saved in Lord Jesus Christ and there's still some besetting sin issues. And as a pastor and as a church, we're called to come alongside those who are struggling in their sanctification and hope for better for each and every member within the family of God, that they would grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not the same. Our testimonies are all different. And our sanctification stories are all different. But they should generally, generally be the same when it comes to our status and how our nature has been transformed. So Paul identifies in the first three verses this former bondage. He says, he states that we were dead in the trespasses and sins. And when he says that we're dead, he's referring to the spiritual death. That is common to all. Notice that at the end of verse 3, he says, like the rest of mankind. And of course, that is qualifying more specifically what he says in verse 3. But it's also a broader description of everything he's talking about in verses 1 through 3. That all of mankind, all of mankind outside of Christ, is spiritually dead. 
And they're dead in something. And, and Paul lists those things as trespasses and sins. This would be violation of God's eternal moral law. All of mankind is culpable, morally culpable. It is true that if you were a child of Abraham and you were brought into covenant relationship with God and you were in the Mosaic covenant and you had the law that God's revelation was clear to those children of Israel and they had a higher responsibility because of God's revelation. But Paul makes clear in Romans 1 that all of mankind, even pagans and Gentiles who don't have the word of God, God's moral revelation is still sufficient right, to condemn the conscience of those who have violated God's moral law. So there is an eternal moral law that finds its origin in God's nature and identity. And the guilt and the shame that mankind feels is because they have rebelled against God. And Paul lists them as trespasses and sins. He says in verse 2, and once you once walked. This is, I mean, the best illustration for 1 and 2. He says, you're dead, right? In verse 1, you're dead. And then in verse 2, he says, in which you once walked. Dead people don't walk. Um, unless you're like a zombie. It's like the best illustration I could think of what Paul's describing here in verses 1 and 2. You're dead, but you're still kind of alive. And no one's attracted to zombies, unless you're really weird and there's something wrong with you. But zombies are weird creatures. They're the walking dead. And Paul here is describing this is what our former life was. We were, we were dead, spiritually dead. We were in bondage. But Paul describes the walk, the activities associated with this past spiritual death. And what does he describe here? in verses two through three. Well, he identifies three, what I call enslaving powers over the former self. Three enslaving powers. And what's the first one? He says, in which you once walked following the course, following the course of this world. That's number one. That's the first enslaving power that we were in bondage to outside of Christ. Following the course of this world. Now, to be clear, God created everything and declared it to be good. Our Bible gives a positive affirmation of the world as God created it in Genesis 1. Right? We're not anti-materialists in the sense that all material is bad. God created everything, declared it to be good. But because of Adam and Eve's sin and humanity's rebellion against God, we've disrupted the shalom, the peace, the order in God's creation and his intended blessing. There is disorder and chaos and death in the relationship that mankind has with God through the created order. And because of that, when the scriptures, especially you find it clear in the New Testament, when it talks about the way of this world, or it's clear more in, in John, for example, in his gospel and in his epistles, there's sort of this hostility towards the world, the world order, as it were. And what that's referring to is not the original world as God created it. It's not declaring bad what God declared good, but it is the world that is in opposition to God. And it has this, it sucks us in. We feel the forces of the world following the course of this world. We want to be liked. We want to be accepted. There's, there's, there's just these common desires that's just ingrained in our humanity and because of our sin because of the shame because of the guilt we are all the more needy we are all the more insecure we are we long for family we long for connection and so when we see the prevailing course of the world and all the voices of the world on their terms acceptance on their terms affirmation on their terms it's easy to be sucked in and do the things that the world does in order to be accepted by the world. But one of the things in Scripture that is a sign that we are truly followers of the Lord Jesus Christ is that our allegiance to Jesus as Lord is greater than anything else, any other allegiance over us. And yes, the power of the world, the sway of the world's opinion and thought, 
might be strong upon, upon us, but as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pledge allegiance to him. But before the Lord Jesus Christ, many of us, we were struggling to be liked. Many of us did stupid things to be accepted among our peers. And you look with great embarrassment upon those former days, the dumb things you did in order to be accepted and liked. And that's the former way of life that Paul describes in verse 2 here. It's one of the enslaving powers, the world. What's the second one? He says, following the prince of the power of the air. The second enslaving power is the devil. It's the devil. So, following the course of the world, number one. Number two, carrying out the desires, or, or no, that's number three. Sorry, number two, following the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. There is a satanic bondage for those who are outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And honestly, it's difficult to think of our family and our friends and our neighbors, some of them that might be relatively decent people who don't have a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, they are being deceived and duped by the devil. Now, God's common grace, God's truth is God's truth. So even our pagan friends, if there's any beauty and truth and goodness that's in them, it's all owing to God's grace that's even extended even over our unbelieving friends. But their allegiance, the allegiance of their heart, if God is not Lord, something else is. If Jesus is not Lord over your heart, then something else is Lord. There's something else that fills that void. There isn't this neutrality that exists. And so Paul describes in bleak terms this bondage for those who are outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are following the prince of the power of the air. Now, what might that look like? It, it looks, well, Satan is crafty, and it doesn't always look the same. It, it's not Satan with horns and a pitchfork and trying to get you addicted to meth or trying to get you to leave your wife. That's one way Satan might work, and it might be powerful. He, it, the overt, clearly disobedient bondage issues that Satan pulls people into. But I think Satan, he's also an angel of light, right? He's, he's deceptive. And it's possible that your idols aren't adul adultery or meth or some sort of severe, blatant addiction, but your idols might be a lot more subtle. And Satan has you in a trap. It might be taking good things and making them ultimate things in your life, and Satan has just as much sway over that person. The legalist who strives to be good but is not looking to the Lord Jesus Christ or to glorify him is ultimately still under the sway of the evil one who has deceived them. Because I believe that outside of Christ, we have a guilty conscience that needs to be cleansed. And Satan finds all kinds of creative ways to try to appease the conscience of non-believers. And whether it's acceptance with the world, whether it is addiction or other things to try to escape the pain of the world, or whether it's confidence in one's own moral uprightness or other things to try to find meaning in life by erecting other idols other than the Lord Jesus Christ as ways to try to appease the guilty mind. Satan is at work in all of that. So what is the third enslaving power? And, and I kind of gave a preview earlier when I started reading verse 3. The third one is in verse 3. And in verse 3, what does Paul describe? He, he, he leaves verse 2 by describing the sons of disobedience, and that's just a description of humanity and disobedience and rebellion against God. And then verse 3 says, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. So the third enslaving power is the flesh. Perhaps you've heard it described this way, sort of this, <clears throat> this um, unholy trinity that's at work against us. <clears throat> the world, the devil, and our flesh. And our flesh, again, same reminder about the world. The world as God created is good. Our flesh, God created our flesh. God created our bodies. Our bodies are so important that Jesus is resurrected in a glorified body and we all have the promise of future resurrection. 
just a reminder, sometimes our notions of heaven, leaving this body and being in a disembodied spirit in, a, in another place, in the presence, in the immediate presence of God, that's the, a lot of us are thinking of the intermediate state as the permanent state in our thoughts of heaven. And we need to be reminded every Easter of the future resurrection of the body, that the permanent state is the resurrection of the body and the new creation of the heavens and earth with our resurrected bodies in the presence of the Lord who comes and sets up his throne on this earth. Christ ruling and reigning here. It is God being reconciled, as it were, to a world that's been in rebellion to him. And God completes the redemption project of not just saving us, but saving the world and bringing us all together in this world. But the world, as it's the flesh, as it's described here, it it speaks more of the fallen flesh. Because of sin, we are all messed up and we have lots of baggage. Whether it's fear whether it's anxiety. Jesus talks about a lot of things. Worry could be those things. Or it could be just pure out hedonism and our pursuit for pleasure, that we put pleasure above all else, pleasure above relationships, and we're constantly just seeking, we're pleasure seekers, looking for the next thing that might give us some dose of pleasure, and we're willing to just throw people aside in the pursuit of pleasure. Whatever that looks like in, in our fallen flesh, whether, whether it's the anxiety and worry, whether it's the pursuit of pleasure and fear, whether it's acting more like an animal than like a human created in the image of God. The Genesis, Genesis 1 and 2 make very clear that we are unique creations, that we are created in the image of God. But oftentimes, acting according to the flesh is to rise no higher than these animalistic instincts of just pursuing food and relationship. And again, pursuing it with no moral restraint. Sort of a description of the flesh. Just complete and total disregard for the moral consequences of our actions. To just do what pleases us in the moment. To be captive to pleasure-seeking in the moment. But Paul describes in verse 3 that we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. He gives a further description, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. John Calvin says the mind is an idle factory. It describes here the, the powers of the depraved mind. And we have to catch ourselves as those in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a battle that we have to fight all the time. Paul says to take every thought captive. Because Satan is constantly trying to, to try to get an in in our mind. There are times when you're just drifting through the day and there are thoughts that pop up into our mind. And, and I like how Martin Luther describes it. Martin Luther, the great reformer, he says, you know, we, we're, we, we can't keep the thoughts from popping into our mind, but we... We, we can prevent a bird, right, from nesting on our head. Sort of the illustration he gives. You can't, you can't keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep birds from nesting and making a home in your head. And so these thoughts come across, and you've got to kill them. You've got to hit the delete button right away. I've been there where your mind starts drifting. It's not just the deviant things. It's not just those sort of things. It's things like, you know, I'm not happy with my wife and my family. You know what? I deserve better. It's stuff like that. Satan tries to get you all kinds of ways. You know what? Um, I deserve better. Satan lifting up pride, sense of entitlement. Satan might get into your head and have you think about pursuing life on your own terms rather than trusting God. You're making all these sacrifices for God. Where has that gotten you? Why don't you do life your own way? I mean, Satan will come at you with all kinds of stuff, and he just wants you to sit there and think and just fantasize in his lies about how you would be happier if you followed him. So Paul makes clear it's, it's not just the desires of the body, it's, it's the mind. 
And we were once by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Verse 3. So mankind is under the sway of these three powers, these enslaving powers. And then verse 4, there's this great contrast. But God... So if the story were to end with verse 3, it's, it's, it's a bleak story. The story of humanity, just the first three verses... The story ends there. But God intervenes in verse 4. God's under no obligation to intervene. But God enters the picture of your depraved story. You are a sinner in rebellion. And God did the chasing. God did the initiating. God did the pursuing. Because what's described in verses 1 through 3, it doesn't describe a seeker of God. It doesn't describe someone who's morally neutral. Describe someone who's walking in trespasses and sins. Someone who's following the world. Someone who's under the sway of Satan. And someone who's obeying the flesh and the fallen thoughts of the mind. That is the description in the first three verses. God looked upon us in our fallen state And God was moved, and this is quite surprising, the holy God loved us in our fallen state. And of course, the reason we have the cross is because a holy God can't have relationship with a disobedient, rebellious child like us without something reconciling this vast, Separation. So God, he intervenes to save us and he intervenes to change us. To have relationship with us. But the motive is his love, verse 4. And the motivation also in verse 7, kind of fast forwarding, the so that in verse 7 is huge. Whenever you see so that in the Bible... It's, it's, giving a, it's answering the why question. God also intervenes to save, verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. But God, in verse 4, he is rich in mercy. That's the other thing. is How, how, do, you, how do we understand... How God's holiness and his mercy reconcile in his eternal attributes as God. This is, this is sort of the mystery, the drama of scripture, that these things need to be reconciled. God is holy. He doesn't compromise his holiness. And God is rich in mercy, and he doesn't compromise his mercy. How does a holy God act in mercy? And the answer is the cross. That is how a holy God acts in mercy He doesn't surrender his holiness, and he doesn't surrender his mercy. Both are maintained and upheld in and through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul here in verse 4, he's emphasizing God's love. God is rich in mercy. Thank God for being rich in mercy. He is wealthy. He is wealthy and rich in mercy. That's good news for us. Because if God was not merciful, we would not be saved. God was rich in mercy. Paul describes because of the great love with which he loved us. In verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together. So it's describing a sequence, a chronology, the timing Paul here is framing when when God intervened. When we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So notice mercy, love, and grace, all in verses 4 and 5. Those are rich words. And I'm running out of time this morning. But you're familiar with these words. Mercy, love, and grace. And Paul uses these words in verses 4 through 5 to describe who God is and what God did. 
And he made us alive, verse 5. He made us alive together with Christ. So this is, this is a status that we have. It's also a relationship that we have. We were separated from the Lord Jesus Christ, and salvation consists of God the Father reconciling us to the Lord Jesus Christ so that we become children of God in the eternally begotten Son, Jesus. We have been made alive in Christ Jesus, verse 5. This idea of union in Christ is so powerful in, in Scripture, and you see it clearly in Paul. This idea of being in Christ. We are in Christ. God brought you into relationship with Christ, and by this relationship with Christ, we are in him, and being in Christ, we derive a, a new status, and we also derive a new nature. And it all flows from being united to Jesus. I hate cheesy illustrations, so some, I think this illustration is sometimes a little cheesy, but it's the best I can come up with. But my vacuum cleaner or anything else doesn't work unless you plug it in, right? And so we are plugged into the Lord Jesus Christ, but in relationship. You shouldn't just think of electric current so that we can go do what we're doing. But we don't function. We don't function if we're not united to the Lord Jesus Christ. And God has united us to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been made alive because Paul described us what in verse 1? What was our past status? We were dead. And God made us alive. He gave us new life. The language that Paul's using here, it brings us back to Genesis 1, when God spoke life into existence. God's creative powers are at work in us. It was God who resuscitated us. That's a picture that I like. We were dead. We were resuscitated by the breath of God who breathes again new life into us. And it's all because of his mercy and his love and his grace. And it's by grace that we have been saved, verse 5. No one saved. No one saved from a fire. No one saved from peril boast and how they save themselves. All glory goes to the rescuer. All glory goes to the rescuer. I'm trapped in a burning building. I am going to die. Unless someone broke in, unless someone applied water, unless someone intervened, I am toast. And Paul he describes how God intervened into our peril. He saved us, <clears throat> and he situates us, in verses 5 and 6, in the Lord Christ Jesus, and he uses this exalted language in verse 6 of being raised, in the Lord Christ Jesus, we are co-resurrected and we are co-exalted. At the end of verse 6, he has seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He has lifted us in the Lord Christ Jesus. You have been lifted in your salvation. What does it mean to be lifted in the Lord Christ Jesus? It means those, those enslaving powers of our former life, we're above them. The course, the world's influence, we're above it. At least we ought to be above it. We're situated in the Lord Christ Jesus. Satan, who's trying to pull us down, we are above it. We're in the Lord Christ Jesus. We're signed, sealed, and delivered. We are property of God. Satan will still try his best, trip us up. But we belong to God. And then the flesh, yes, we're still in this body, and this body still has its baggage from our former self. But the prospects of sanctification is that by growing in the Lord Jesus Christ, and Paul gets to that in verses 8 through 10, as a new creation, we are a new project. We, we, God has, is painting a new picture with our lives. We are seated and raised in the Lord Jesus Christ, verses 5 and 6. And then verse 7 answers the why question. It's 
not just because of God's mercy and his love and grace, which we see in verses 4 and 5, but verse 7, God wants to display his mercy to the world. Now, this is a pretty intimidating thought, but our salvation, your testimony, what God did in your life, is God's way of showing, bragging on, displaying to the world his mercy and grace. And do our lives, do our lives show forth in verse 7 what Paul says God intends to show the world? The immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is intended to say, is your life so good that it's worth bragging about? But is God's mercy at work in your life? And if his mercy is at work in your life, then you have something to boast about. And of course, your boast is in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he is doing. But Paul is saying all of this is supposed to be apparent. It's intended for God to display his mercy and his grace in verse 7. That you're changed. You're not the same. And then verses 8 through 10 in closing... Paul reminds us again, he says it twice. He already said it in verse 5. He says it again in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. We ought to be humbled, right? This former portrait of who we were in verses 1 through 3, God loved us still even though we were ugly and dead and in rebellion and in bondage, really messed up. God loved us, took us in, reconciled us and seated us in the Lord Jesus Christ, made us alive. That was our former portrait. But God is at work in us. He's painting a new portrait, which Paul refers to in verse 10. Paul makes it clear it's by grace you have been saved. There's no boasting. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. This is good news for us. In verse 9, that works aren't what saved us or contributed to our salvation. It's not what earned our salvation. Paul's very clear about that. It's so that in our salvation, no one may boast. You can't take credit for your salvation. And then verse 10, the new life that Paul describes, we are his workmanship. This is very different than what he describes in verse 1, dead in trespasses and sins. We are now his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And how did we walk in verse 2? We were walking after the world. We were walking after Satan. We were walking after the flesh. And how do we walk now in the Lord Christ Jesus? We walk in good works which God prepared beforehand. We are God's workmanship. We are his poema. We are his artifact, his poem, his piece of art. God took the past canvas, got rid of it, and God has made us alive and is at work in us. Now, as we close this morning, reflecting on this, this is all a lot of good news, great news, the greatest news that we can hear and know and experience. Some of us are still struggling. Our our lives might still be stuck in the verses one through three portrait that Paul describes. There still might be shame and guilt. As we know, God's creating this wonderful picture, but every time we sin, every time we do something stupid, it's like just spilling a bunch of neon green paint on the canvas or something. Just messing up. It's like, oh, we just made a mess. And the good news, and this is not to be taken for granted or to be abused, but Paul affirms clearly that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. It's not so that we might sin more, experience more grace. But I just want to encourage you as the church. In Christ, I have sinned. I've sinned in Christ. Has anybody else sinned since you became a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay, a few of you. (laughs) Sorry, All, all of you. All of you have sinned. 
since coming to a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's grace, I just want to be careful I say this, he takes even what we do to disrupt and mess up the canvas, and God, he either uses it, paints over it, and then he's still at work. God's the one with the brush. He's the potter, and we're the clay. I know that could be sort of a fearful thing, because we're very small in this equation. But what's reassuring is God's the one who's at work. He's the one who started a good work in us, right? And the Bible tells us very clearly, if he he started the work, he's going to complete the work. He's the author and the finisher. And even the things that you've done in rebellion against God as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, God, his mercy and grace just paints over it. Better yet, he even uses, I'm going to be careful how I say this, he even uses, he even uses your mistakes and your sins as part of a testimony and humility and greater dependence upon him and your sanctification. He, he uses it in the canvas, and at the end, he gets all the glory, and it's perfect and it's beautiful because God's the one who's writing the story. And who are we? that we should complain about how God writes his story. But to be very clear, there is moral culpability on our part. We are to walk in verse 10, not verses 1 through 3. But I just wanted to share some encouragement, because I know I struggle. Every time I blow it, when pride comes in, when there's lack of patience, when I'm not being as gracious and as patient, and I'm not showing the qualities of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it's in my family, in relationships with neighbors, whether it's in how I react to bad drivers who cut me off without signaling. Um, There's all kinds of things that come out of this, this body, this mind, that I know doesn't honor and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And when those oops moments happen, or those woe is me moments happen, the Lord is always gracious to restore us and to be faithful to us. He doesn't throw us away. There's, there's nothing you can do as God's workmanship that God says, you know what, I'm just I'm going to throw, throw you away. Sorry, you, you, messed, you messed it up. I can't work with this. God is at work in us. He is faithful. And he is merciful. If he saved us when we were that bad, he's not going to abandon us when we trip up and make mistakes as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. If he loved us at our worst, he's not going to abandon us on the journey. It's not going to be like, you know what? I didn't foresee this happening. Lord God is merciful. He loves you. He is gracious. He has saved you. You were bad. You were really bad. You stunk. You were ugly. You were morally repugnant. And God loved you. He took you in. He reconciled you. He made you alive. He breathed new life into you. He introduced you to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and said, here, be united to my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You are loved by him. You are held. We are held by God the Father. We are held by the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his workmanship, and we have this new call. We have this new charge. We don't walk after the world. We don't walk after Satan. We don't walk after the flesh. We walk after the Lord Jesus Christ. We walk after the good works, in verse 10, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. We are called to walk in good works. And what are these good works? In closing, God's moral law. We're called to love God and love our neighbor. Those are the general callings of walking in good works. The Bible also calls us to mercy and justice. We are to be benevolent, merciful people. We are also to be people who pursue and love justice. And then some of you are gifted in a unique way. The spiritual gifts are diverse. And some of us are called to walk in good works of faith. And maybe some of you are better at giving than others. Some of you are more patient with others. Some of you might have a unique gift of hospitality or other things. And those are the good works that you're called to work in. And some of us might not know what those particular gifts are, but to be very clear, God's moral law to love God, love neighbor, not steal, not commit adultery, not do those things, that's what God has called us all to, to walk in good works, to 
to love mercy, to love justice. But what is your particular gifting? As we close this morning, as far as walking in good works, I want to exhort us after comforting us. We're all messed up. We're still messed up, even though we're in the Lord Jesus Christ. God still loves us. He's still at work in us. But the exhortation here is, what are the good works that you are working, walking in? Have you identified? And everyone's personality is different. Sometimes some of you are more spontaneous. Some of you have like daily planners and you plan out the whole year in advance. Some of you scare me. Those of you plan out like the whole year in advance. I try to do about a month and it's subject to change. But what are the good works that you are walking in? How are you displaying God's mercy in your life to the world, according to verse 7? And it's not so that you can boast in the good works that you're doing, but we are called to good works so that we can tell God's story of mercy and grace. We use good works as an opportunity to show forth his mercy and grace. And so my exhortation as we close this morning is to prayerfully consider, as you, as you leave this morning, maybe you go home, you journal, and, and you, you really ask yourself this question, what, what are the good works that I'm walking in that God prepared before him that I should walk in? Have you identified them? Have you listed them? And I want to exhort you to press on. And I know the one hindrance to pressing on might be, you know, my, my life's kind of, I'm still, I don't have it all together. I, I'm still imperfect. Who am I to try to be this go-getter and, and follow the Lord Jesus Christ? And I want to say that's a lame excuse because God foresaw your sin and he dealt with it. That's probably the voice of Satan trying to keep you back from being everything that God's called you to be. Satan wants us to be stuck in verses 1 through 3. And he wants to, he's going to lie to us and tell us that's what your status is. You're just a child. You're, God, you're not saved. God doesn't love you. God hasn't accepted you. You're rejected. Don't try to do anything for God. He hates you. For some, I know that that voice is powerful, has sway, keeps you back. You need to hear the voice of God. You need to hear the voice of Scripture. God's mercy, his love, his grace. You are his workmanship. You are loved. God is at work in you. You are created for good works, which he prepared beforehand that you should walk in. You need to hear the voice of God over your life and pursue it for his glory. Let's close in prayer. The worship team would come forward. Also close in song. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we close this morning having heard your word presented in scripture. And Lord, we submit ourselves to you as your workmanship this morning. Lord, we are the clay and you are the potter. Apart from you, we can do nothing Forgive us, Lord, for anything that we've tried to do apart from Jesus. It's just destined to die. It's vain. We are called to do all things in and through you so that there might be lasting fruit with our lives. And Lord, some of us this morning might need to be reminded more that we are saved by grace and your mercy and, and we need to be encouraged. And Lord, I certainly pray that over those who need to hear that message. We also need to hear that we're called for good works, which we prepared beforehand, that, that the description of our walk in the way of the world, under the bondage of Satan, in obedience to our fallen flesh, that that's our former life. And I pray that it would be so. And Lord, I pray that that would be behind us and that we would walk in new ways of obedience to you. Lord, as we leave this morning, unless you strike us dead on the way out, you have a plan and a purpose for the rest of our day, the rest of this week. We owe our lives to you. And so I pray that whatever we do in the coming day, in the coming weeks, we would glorify and honor you. And Lord, certainly we're doing that when we're faithful to, our, um, when we're faithful to the callings that you have over our lives. We, we are honoring and glorifying you. But I pray, Lord, that there would, there would be a sense of particular mission that there are good works that we are carrying out that we don't boast in, we don't take any glory for, we know that it's something that you have called us to, and that there would be joy and obedience and surrender to what you are calling us to, Lord, I pray. That you grant us that, that we would be effective as a church, that as, as the body, the family of God, we would display your mercy upon our lives as a church, 
so that the community might see your mercy at work in us. And Lord, that these good works that we commit to, they would glorify you, that they would serve our neighbors, Lord, that they would bring you glory. That is our desire, is that you would be glorified in our story, in our testimony, that it would give all glory to you. So Lord, that is what we seek. That is our aim and prayer. So Lord, I pray that even in this last song, that your spirit would just work in our hearts and just confirm and seal in our hearts, Lord, what, what you've called us to and what you've done in our lives. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to please stand as we close in song this morning. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.